A very good morning to all of you. Good morning, chairpersons. And uh, at the out very outset, let me thank the organizers of the conference. It's been a splendid two days and uh, really an academic feast. And I'm really honored to be a part of this academic team. Thank you very much. Well, the topic which was assigned is technical, technological advances in, in anesthesia. To me, technology would be advancing every day, but it's the science which makes all the difference. Different companies will come up with different technologies and there is, and you will be bombarded with a lot of technological advances. But we want to see how these two things can be integrated as far as science and technology is concerned. So very basis of anesthesia is producing unconsciousness. Until date, awakening and, and producing or getting reanimation out is defined by pharmacological agents. Until recently, when we learned that there was one pharmacological agent which would actually activate arousal pathways and induce reanimation, and that is methylphenidate. Well, the scientists went ahead and they found that if the ventral tegmental area was stimulated, it induces reanimation while the inhalational agents or anesthetic agents are, are continued. So while you are delivering anesthetic agents and if you happen to electrically stimulate this area, the animal would be wide awake and all the writing reflexes would be restored. This was something remarkable. And this study, which was initially published in animals, showed where the electrodes were put. And this is the ventral tegmental area. They gave both isoflurane as well as propofol. And in all the mice, or the five rats which they, stu which they studied, they found that the lighting reflex was restored. There was another study which came later on and that was basically the electrical activation of glutaminergic parabrachial nucleus. So what are the implications? The implications or the future implications would be that electrical signaling, signaling and electrical network between centers is there in the brain. When we switch on, if you s electrically stimulate, a person can be woken up to full senses while anesthesia is being continued. And when you switch off, like an electrical switch, person is back under anesthesia. So instead of pharmaceutical agents and drugs, in near future, would, it would probably be the electrical stimulation which will control the human brain function. How it happens? Under anesthesia, the brain does not simply shut down. Instead, there are connections between different parts of the brain which are lost. And several studies have demonstrated that the brain is still reactive to stimuli such as light and sound. So in a conscious state, all this networking between different target molecules is existing. But when you give anesthetic drugs, what happens is that they act on a particular target site and this network starts gets, getting disrupted. And therefore, once the target molecules are occupied by these pharmaceutical drugs, there is a disruption of network. But somehow, there are certain areas in the brain where there is reactive stimuli to light and sound. So, we still get auditory evoked potentials, we do get visually evoked potentials which exist and they can be recorded. Now, what happens during recovery? The recovery is not because the drug has been weared off. In all these five or six animals or frequent or the later studies we found that the anesthesia was continued, but as soon as these area was stimulated, there was the re-establishment of the network and the person would be absolutely conscious. So this is something which uh, we need to look at and probably would be a greatest advance which will happen in the field of science. The other one which I would like you to focus is pharmacogenetics. 
Now the issue is that there are different patient groups which exist in our population. And you'll find that all of us give the same diagnosis and give a same prescription for that particular diagnosis. And as far as anesthetists are concerned, it is milligram per kg body weight. That is how we define dosages. But we fail to understand that these drugs may not be toxic, but beneficial in one group of patients. In another cohort, the drug may be toxic, but beneficial. In the third group, you may find that the drug is toxic, but not beneficial at all. And in the fifth group, you will find that it acts like a placebo. It's neither beneficial nor toxic. So remember, we have a very heterogeneous kind of population across our subcontinent. You can have different people behaving differently to the drugs which you administer to them. And it is it may not be the right choice to give milligram per kg body weight of drugs anymore. So what do we need to do? We need to individualize drug therapy to avoid adverse drug reaction and toxic effects. Improve the therapeutic drug efficacy by identifying such patients and also improve the outcomes by adjusting the drug therapies. And for that, you need the right drug, you need the right dose, and you need the right response. That is the most important part. And the most, impo the most interesting part re regarding this would be the genomics. Each one of us have different genes and we respond differently to different drugs. We have just copy pasted a milligram per kg body weight from the Western literature which we have. We all read Miller, very good. The problem is when you say two microgram per kg of body weight of fentanyl, do you think that all our Indian population is going to get benefited from that? I have seen at least 50% of the patients would require just 0.5 micrograms per kg and another 25 over one microgram per kg body weight. And that's sufficient for us. Earlier, we used to give intramuscular medications like pethidine, like morphine. And we allowed sufficient time for their action. And when the patient is wheeled into the theater, and if you find the patient is already sedated, we knew that the dose of the narcotic is now sufficient. You don't have to administer any more because there are three stages in which narcotics act. The first one is analgesia. The second one is sedation. And the third one would be respiratory depression. So if you have already reached the stage of sedation, that means analgesia is covered up. Nowadays, it is IV fentanyl and we do not allow to see, we do not even wait for the action to come to see what is the patient's response. And immediately, an induction agent is given thereafter. So that is the problem with the modern anesthesia, the way we practice. We forget about the pharmacokinetics of the drug. When is the peat action? How much time there should be, delay should be there when we administer each drug to the patient? Now let's talk about the genes, how they implicate the administration or the drug administration. This is a double DNA helix. If you unwind it, you'll find there are nucleotides which are bound to each other. So nucleotide has three structures. It basically has a phosphate group. It will have a sugar moiety and then it will have a nitrogenous base consisting of various amino acid pairs. So these base pairs would be the one which are defined for a particular location. But instead of adenine, adenine, if something else or some other amino acid is replaced in that particular site, then it is a polymorphism or there is a problem or there is some different gene which is now going to act. So that is how the single nucleotide polymorphisms are seen. And basically, in analgesia, as far as anesthetic implications are concerned, 
you have intrinsic pain mechanisms you have pharmacodynamics where drug receptors and drug molecules have and you have pharmacokinetics so let's talk about the pharmacodynamics first the drug receptor how polymorphism can affect the drug receptors there's something called as an OPRM OPRM1 gene which is specific to the opioid mu opioid receptors and what has happened here is a single nucleotide polymorphism is seen where adenine is substituted by G or guanine at position 118 and mere substitution of one amino acid at that particular site would cause increased opioid requirements. The second one is about the drug efflux molecule. This is P glycoprotein. Normally what happens is the green one which is shown here is the drug molecule which passively diffuses into the brain tissue and then it has to be actively by the ATP generated mechanism be effluxed out of the brain. But when there is a polymorphic poly, a P glycoprotein which is encoded by, by, by MDR genes, then what happens is the drug molecule goes inside the brain, but it is not able to efflux out. And it remains in the brain. And therefore, you will have enhanced entry of opioids into the CNS of specifically these molecules, and these patients would be highly sensitive. And believe me, we have found almost 28 kind of single nucleotide polymorphisms in Indian population right now. What about excretion and metabolism? Let's say codeine. Codeine is generally metabolized by demethylation to morphine, which produces analgesia. And also it is, and the CYP3A4 is responsible for its clearance. However, when the CYP2D6 gets into polymorphism, you'll find it has two mechanisms. One is poor metabolism, the other is ultra rapid metabolism. The poor metabolism leads to decreased morphine formation that causes inadequate analgesia. While ultra rapid metabolism of codeine leads to opioid intoxication. And because there is ultra, ultra rapid metabolism, there is concaminant inhibition of CYP 3A4, and therefore there is decreased codeine clearance. This leads to codeine intoxication. And this is a gene which normally in the Western countries, all children are screened for before they are given codeine. So that is how the screening is being done nowadays as soon as the child is born. What is the Indian perspective to this? And I'm very happy to say that we have come out with two publications. It's online print. My PhD scholar has just completed his dissertation on this. And we have predicted that there are almost 28 pairs of, of polymorphisms which are existing in India. And you have to be very careful when you talk about narcotic administration. So please give adequate time when you administer a narcotic, wait for its clinical response. And if there is a suspected problem in the action, get them genotyped. Now let's come to the electric equipment design. In the last six, seven minutes, I will try to cover that. Yes, artificial intelligence and anesthesia is bombarding us in a big way, but remember, this has started from the year 1988, so it's nothing new. Artificial intelligence, by definition, is something which is designed in a computer system that exhibits intelligent behavior. And these machines would make the expert level judgments easier and also give recommendations. Or more practically, you'll have machine which serves as intelligent assistance to you. Therefore, something similar to smartphones. These are what we get in our daily to daily uses. And I believe these equipment can be used in the operating rooms where you can have different apps. Let's say for a patient with diabetes, you feed in a sugar value, it gives you at this particular time, this much of infusion of insulin has to go. Infusions can be targeted by using these kind of simple apps which can be designed and it would be highly 
it will really improve the patient's safety. They can be apps-based teaching and learning, and there are these apps which are already existing. But what about anesthesia? There is something which is called as a prediction index. And the most recently, there are a few papers which has come about for hypotension prediction index. And there is an algorithm which has been incorporated into the hemosphere monitor of the Edward Sciences. I'm not an advocate and we have no conflict of interest, but it's interesting. Interesting because you can directly predict a hypotension which can occur at five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And if the hypotension prediction index is greater than 85, it is more likely to happen during these intervals. So this is the kind of screen which you have. So how can you handle this? Like I said, HPI, if it is 45, there's only 45% chance of the person having hypotension in the next forthcoming minutes. But if it is 85, the chance is extremely bleak. So what does it tell you? How does it predict? It has the stroke volume variation. Here it is 11. So you can judge the preload whether you need to correct the preload because it is probably suspecting that your preload may not be enough and contribute to hypotension in the forthcoming minutes. It can also tell you the contractility index that is DPDT max and it is derived from the arterial slope waveform and that is what helps it to predict whether there's going to be a problem with the contractility of the heart so that you can have your inotropes ready in time. Looking at the dynamic arterial elastance, which takes the ratio between the pulse pressure variations and the stroke volume variations, it can depict the afterload. And is it because of the afterload increase that the hypotension may occur later because the heart is not able to contract against that resistance? So you can take preventive actions to make sure such incidents can be avoided. So HPI is a real-time monitor which gives you a continuous prediction of intraoperative hypotension and decreases the incidence of cumulative duration of IOH. Well, the sample size are less, the studies are few, but it still needs to be consolidated and let's see how it comes or changes our future way of anesthesia management. Point of ultrasound care. You don't have to measure anymore. The technology tells you which is the inspiratory, what is the expiratory diameter, and even gives you the collapsibility index. So is the B-lines. You really don't have to count them. It, the monitor will detect you and tell you how many B-lines exist in that particular field. What about equipment design? You have anesthesia robot. It's been there for some time, but it's never made a breakthrough because I think Technology can always, cannot replace humans. The humans will have to be there to manage the technology. That's the gold standard and that is how it is going to be, believe me. Well, this had a closed loop TIVA system for feedback where the system would automatically adjust the dosages according to the BIS value. Muscle relaxation would be adjusted according to the phonomyography and the pain and hemodynamic uh, variables were also there. But this machine is interesting. This is a QAM machine, which is a closed system, liquid injection, and it gives you a xenon option because of the environmental issues as far as the carbon footprint is concerned, ozone layer depletion is concerned, I think inert gases probably would be the future. And you already have one machine which is xenon based, and it has got no ecotoxical effects and all the pharmacokinetic effect, effects of an of a inhalational agent. What about airway? There's something new which has come as far as the tubes are concerned. Remember, we have introducers. We like to use stilets. We like to use certain airway exchange catheters to guide the tube. But this is one of the tubes which have come up, which has a channel embedded into its, into its substance so that you can pass in a guide wire without obstructing the lumen. The advantage is that at the cords, if there is an obstruction or you meet some sort of a resistance, the tip collapses. It doesn't harm the cords at all. And when it comes out, it re-expands. 
if you use a stilet or any sort of a bougie, the lumen is not allowed to be compressed. And therefore, that kind of occupancy of the lumen is hazardous and can cause problems. There are a lot of issues which have been reported as far as airway morbidity is concerned with regard to airway introducers. So this is the kind of tube which has been marketed. And I'm happy to share we have done preliminary, preliminary studies in it. And it is really found to be helpful by, by the use of it. This is the voice analysis which we did and we found this tube was extremely useful. So just to summarize what I have already told to you, anesthesia related science is more important and equipment and technology should match the science, not overtake the science. And if I was to be the patient, I would not surrender my body to only machines. I need a compassionate human being to hold my hand, a thoughtful mind and skillful hands to help heal me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, excellent talk. As you said that uh, Dr. Meenakshi was telling we should be there and the technology, when both are there, that should complement us, not uh, fully overtake us, technological advances. Because if we are thinking that, uh, showing the photos that we are having the mobiles and other things hand and all. But in advanced, uh, this thing, we have the monitors and other things too. Maybe is it in future without drug? Can we give anesthesia with the only electrical? We are telling we can wake up and get the patients. Uh, so the, will that will come in the future? So this is an experimental study. There I've been able to identify at least four studies now. And interestingly, this paper was was actually presented in a, a neurosciences conference in Sweden. And if you look at the video, it was amazing. I don't have the video with me. The rats were totally anesthetized. The moment they were stimulated, they, their right reflex was restored. Right means that if you are prone, they will immediately turn supine and all the reflexes were intact. And the moment they stopped stimulating, they were absolutely anesthetized. So you look at the video and you see that this is a remarkable change which probably would happen in near future. You may have scalp electrodes, which would probably do that, generate that kind of voltage to stimulate the deep brain areas. But I think science is evolving very fast. Sir. Pankas, sir, you have elaborated the topic very nicely. Uh, we all know that we are in 177th year of anesthesia today. In first few years, means a lot of years, we were just struggling to introduce anesthesia, yes, to make it available to everybody. Then I think after 80s or so, up to 2000, we were in safety in anesthesia. And in 2000 onwards, we are in the development and technological developments in anesthesia. Yes, For last 20, 25 years, we are in this. <clears throat> to the extent we have reached that, we have lot many non-invasive procedures in the operation theaters. And now we have reached to the delivery technologies, anesthesia delivery technologies also. So it's really very good on your part. You had touched HPI, QAM and everything, which I read sometimes back. That was a good revision for me. And it's really coming up in the market and it will definitely take up some more other day. And uh, should we open the topic for questions, sir? Yes. If anybody wants to have a question from the audience, oh, they are welcome, please. No, just because the chairperson wanted to know whether the machines will replace the mankind, I want to say whatever may be the development of machines, it is always the man behind the machine is important. And even if you have machines fitted with the artificial intelligence, to interpret it, we need natural intelligence. Then only we can operate the machine. So comparing the past and the present, I think definitely machines will come into anesthesia practice. But always there will be a man behind it. Without a man, machine will be useless. So as long as the mankind survives, it will be always an anesthesiologist who dictates. But again, as I stressed, the fees is to be paid to the anesthesiologist, not to the machine. Thank you. Any questions from anybody or any comments? Otherwise, we'll find a business. There are no questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.